in a very uh, basic way about uh, teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And most of you are not familiar with my um, theme of uh, uh, and uh, style of presentation and uh, this language barrier to some extent as well, so I try to speak simply about the subject that uh, most of you, all of you should be familiar with. And um, so that we want to turn to the Shikshasa Kamitra. This is, of course, uh, a, um, a series of verses, Sanskrit verses, about to be composed by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself. They appear first in the work of Guru Vasani, a Gallery collection of uh, verses by known and in some cases unknown authors. And he uh, groups the verses, many verses together under different headings. And the verses of Shikshastakam are also found in there under different headings, along with other verses. But um, they are not presented in Shuruba's uh, work as uh, one consistent uh, group of verses uh, as we think and have come to know of uh, Shikshastra. And um, as some of you may be aware, the grouping of those verses together and the idea that they were spoken uh, as well by Mahaprabhu one after another in one uh, sequence and in one setting comes from the, uh, the work of Kaduraj Krishnas, uh, author of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, amongst, amongst other works. Um, and he places the Shikshastakam at the end of Chaitanya Charitamrita, the very last uh, verses of Chaitanya Charitamrita. And uh, the way in which he has presented them there, of course, uh, in the context of the narrative of the Leela, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is at this time no longer a public figure. Hmm? Uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita is uh, a book, of course, that was Krishnadas was commissioned to write by the Vrindavan Goswamis. And with emphasis on the on the Madhya Lila of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The prior uh, works, works dealing with the life of uh, the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, placed more emphasis on the his Leela in, in Nadia, in Navadri. For example, Vrindavan Das's book, Chaitanya Bhagavad, has much more detailed description of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes in Navadri than it does his later pastimes in Jagannath and his travels. And Krishna Das repeatedly defers to Vrindavan Das in his work. And in his own writing, considers that his work is just a little extension of the major contribution uh, brought to us by Vrindavanas um, Thakur and Chaitanya Bhagavad. That said, of course, the uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita is quite a bit more sophisticated of the book in its language, lyrically speaking. Um, and uh, more so uh, in terms of accurately representing the uh, vision, experience, and understanding of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that uh, is found in the heart of Rupa Goswami. Books like Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, at the time of its writing, uh, abound, if you will. Uh, in uh, various traditions 
religious traditions works about saintly persons and so forth that take certain liberties and liter literary, um, are very, very kind of political in a sense, these type of books. Uh, by that I mean they, a saintly person from a particular angle of vision. Hmm? There are stories uh, that are based on a true story. Hmm? So we have movies based on a true story. And at the same time, there's, there's a lens through which that true story is, is viewed. So the lens of Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami, through which the true story of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu hmm, is, is told, is, is the lens of the, the Rupa Goswami, the Vrindavan Goswami. And so their works are cited throughout. Uh, I remember when I was young, and I was, a, I was one of the first devotees in the Western world to read the Chaitanya Charitamrita. I was fortunate in that regard, as mentioned by Malati, I was famous for the circulation and distribution of my uh, Marsh's books. And uh, I had a close connection with one of the devotees who was um, in charge of the press. Uh, his name is Rameshwar. And we may have heard of him, cover of mine. And so, when Chaitanya Charitamrita was being printed, it was being printed over a two month period, 17 volumes of books. Uh, there's a story behind that, it's probably somebody familiar with that, probably one of them all printed right away and so forth. So the, uh, the press did a marathon to uh, bring out all these books. I was walking with Prabhupada on the beach in Los Angeles when Ramaswar told him where his book was found in terms of keeping Prabhupada's writings. Prabhupada was writing this book and they had printed this book and this book. And Ramaswar was rather, felt like he had a good report to give to Prabhupada that, uh, in terms of how they were keeping up uh, with the pace that he was leading. This was a very extraordinary time in the history of Gaudi uh, Vaishnavism to uh, have 400 page books raining from the, uh, the, spirit, the sky, really, of Prabhupada's heart, month after month after month, and he didn't know if the next person was going to have 10 heads or 15 arms or what. That's an introduction to, uh, to, to, a, to a world that, uh, that made our heads spin, so to speak, just, just to keep up with. Um, with, uh, with the, the Siksha that he was uh, nourishing us with. Um, so at any rate, uh, Ramaswar made the report to, to Prabhupada, and uh, Prabhupada replied to him but, that I have finished the Chaitanya Charitamrita, and so I'm way ahead of you, actually. And, uh, and Ramaswar said that he had, they had calculated at the press that in order to bring out the work, it would consist of 17 volumes. And that they had a plan to bring out, because they were bringing out one, four, three, four hundred page book a month. Prabhupada's Bhagavatam, one book a month. I used to be current, you know, with all the, all the tapes that Prabhupada, every thing he had spoken, and every book that he had read, I was, I was current. So the press was, the press came out with, but he was ahead of us. So he said, uh, you know, I'm 17 books ahead of you then. So Rameshwar, he said that we will, that yes, we have a plan for that as well. And our plan is to print two books of Chaitanya Charitamrita along with the Bhagavatam every month. And that way we'll catch up with you. And Prabhupada said, two books a month? I want all books in two months. <laughs> You can see he was had a mission. <laughs> it was uh, rather compelling, <laughs> and um, Ramaswar fainted on the beach. At the thought of that, and he said, he said that's impossible. And of course, Prabhupada quoted Napoleon. And he said that that uh, impossible is a word in fool's dictionary. <laughs> anyway, they did that. They printed the books in two months, and and. When they printed the books, a certain number of them came off the press 
in advance, the advanced copies. And they had a gold uh, binding around the gold, the gold seal or something. And those were for to give to Prabhupada and some GBCs and so forth. Hmm? The big guys, you know. The leaders. And I was a brahmachari, but I had this connection with Ramasar. He was my friend, but I was very active, of course, in selling the books. And so he sent me one advanced copy as soon as they came out. So we were reading that. And we were in Chicago, actually, um, a Polish city, not far from here. And, um, <laughs> and we were so. I was fortunate to be one of the first uh, devotees to read the Chaitanya Charitamrita in English. And my first impression was, um, as I was saying, that all of the books are found here. Here, I, in this book, there is well, the Bhagavatam is here. It's the distilled essence of the Bhagavad. So many Bhagavad verses are cited. Kaviraj's system, of course, is in the context of the narrative to make a philosophical point, and wherever he makes a philosophical point, then he cites a, a, an evidential or a pramana verse, a verse of evidence from the greater body of sacred texts that would be accepted by Vaishnavas in general, Hindus in general, and by that bring his book into their, their orbit and canonize it, if you will. Um, so, many, many Bhagavatam verses. Indeed, it is the distilled essence of the Bhagavatam and Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu is cited there. Um, Hari Bhakti Vilas, uh, the Sundarvas, uh, Kaviraj's own work, Vindali Lamrita, and the Gita. And so, so, I felt that all the books are present in this book, and indeed it's, that, that's very much the, the case. It's kind of the last work of the founders, the founding acharyas of the, um, of the Sampradaya. <clears throat> and, um, and very uh, orthodox representation of how the Vrindavan Goswamis experienced, understood Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. They, of course, made the effort to locate the ecstasy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu on the map of the sacred uh, texts. They understood that he has to be in there somewhere because he embodies what we are all pursuing. The end of all problems, well, when you're happy, there are no problems. So. So it's all about Ananda. It's all about love. Love uh, resolves all uh, contradictions. In love, uh, one's faults become ornaments. It's said that the mother named her blind son Padmalocha. You understand? Mm -hmm. So who's blind? Mm -hmm. And is it bad? Is there a... <laughs> so to be blinded uh, by love, mm -hmm. this, is, this doesn't fit in a mechanistic uh, scientific materialism that uh, predominates uh, in the world today, whether we realize it or not. Ideas like, for example, that your consciousness can be uploaded in due course onto a computer um, because Consciousness is just a part of the brain, and the brain is a computer, a biological one, and so we can convert it to a digital one, and then the consciousness will remain on a machine, which will have a, have a longer life than the body, and these kind of ideas. Um, as much as they are interesting to people, um, there are movies about them. Um, there was a recent movie, I forget what it was called, so I'm not playing. Hmm? Uh, no, but uh, anyway, he uploaded his consciousness. Uh, to no, no, no. In, 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 invincible or something. No, okay. Something, I'm not out with the latest movies. And it's been going on for, for, for some time now. 
you know, the, these types of movies and stories and theories and and so forth and uh, the digital artificial intelligence kind of world is uh, again becoming very um, prominent and there have been there have been advances of course in artificial intelligence the objective of course then again of, a, of artificial intelligence is to create an a well um, recreate or a human being hmm? You know, a machine that uh, demonstrates that we are just machines and um, and end the argument, so to speak. Mm -hmm. The argument being whether there's anything more than the physical. Mm -hmm. The prominent argument is there's nothing more than the physical. Um, and, uh, uh, and, of course, the goal then is it remains the same. They seek the myth of modern science is 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 to uh, attain kind of a robotic uh, heaven. <laughs> it's not, I don't know if it's a desirable kind of uh, everlasting uh, type of uh, existence. Um, very attractive idea, but. Um, this is this is very much uh, part of the dominant uh, thinking that it, it leaks down to common people and causes them to act in ways that they have not thought out that well, and to subscribe to different ideologies, philosophies, and so forth without thinking them through the implications of them thoroughly. Like you know, a lot of people. Are, reject the idea of God and spirituality and so forth, for example. Um, but um, they don't realize that, uh, to give, to give us, uh, I gave this example last night of contradiction that's prominent. Uh, many people will, in the world, don't believe in God, they think it's just a fairy tale and, uh, and, and, and retire us of suspicions, superstitions and so forth. But they very much, uh, at the same time, want to live a natural life, right? They would maybe they're vegans, for example, or vegetarians, and uh, uh, and um, want to live naturally, eat naturally, and so forth. But there cannot be anything unnatural in a world in which. The worldview, the meta narrative, is materialism, physicalism, or naturalism. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, if the world is simply physical forces and nothing more than that, hmm, then there's nothing unnatural. Oil spills are not unnatural. And Roundup, you know, from Monsanto. The weed killer, you know, it's not unnatural. There's nothing unnatural in a world that consists only of physical forces interacting with one another, which is what, in that worldview, human existence constitutes. There's no purpose, there's no, there's no meaning, there, there's nothing, there can't be anything unnatural it's only natural forces interacting. For there to be something unnatural, there has to be something other than the physical. You understand? Mm -hmm. To go against, to contradict. Mm -hmm. So the very idea that, 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 that man is doing something against, or humans are doing something against nature, if humans are nothing but nature, <laughs> There's no meaning to that idea. So the, very, the the feeling, the sensibility, the common sense of it all is that we are different from nature. There's something about us that separates us from nature. Will, uh, rational thought that, that has bearing on the nature of truth and so forth. We're actually in a, in a, in a, in a world that's only constitutes constitutes of physical forces. Rational thought has no more no bearing on on truth 
there is no right or, or wrong between the different atoms and the way the electrons move. There's no right or wrong, no good or bad. It's, it's ontologically rooted. Hmm? Neither does it, that then implies or mandates that there's no right thought or wrong thought, which puts an end to meaningful discourse altogether. So the implications of um, some of these modern materialistic ideas are probably not very well thought out by most uh, people who uh, embrace them in a simplistic way. It's good for us as devotees to be grounded in, in certain aspects of our philosophy that, um, that, that, it, that, it, that constitutes its, its, its roots, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the Chaitanya tree, the metaphorical tree of, of what we find in Chaitanya Charitamrita, which Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the tree and the branches and the fruits, and, and the roots are his nine sannyasins. Mm -hmm. They're, they have some, uh, they represent uh, detachment. Hmm? This is also a very beautiful thing. You, you, people don't stop to think about it probably, but renunciation, detachment, is glorified by everyone in the world. Everyone in the world thinks that renunciation, detachment, corresponds with truth. What do I mean by that? If you look, for example, at the justice systems in different countries, the justices, the, the lawyers, the attorneys, the judges, or the politicians, they ideally they are to be objective, right? They cannot be swayed by their feelings, by their attachments, by their emotions. If they're too much involved with someone, personally, a judge has to recuse himself and say, I, I cannot uh, sit on the bench and give a verdict in this case because I'm attached. You understand? I'm biased. I'm prejudiced in a particular way. Mm -hmm. So law, which is thought to be, you know, in the political sense, truth, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's thought to arise out of a, a sense of detachment. Science is based on objectivity, which is, again, it's not about how I feel, but let's just see where the facts take me. It's thought, thought to be very courageous and scary, mm -hmm. where it might end up. So, <clears throat> this is a principle of renunciation. This is, the, this is very central to all forms of, of yoga hmm? and, and, and bhakti as well, because as bhakti, it's a byproduct. Hmm? As scary and kind of uh, well, uh, well, foreboding as the thought of applying oneself in terms of renunciation is. Uh, is very much made up for in Gaudiya Vaishnavism by way of uh, dressing up, so to speak, the, the, the act of renunciation. Uh, Uddhava. Uddhava is Krishna's counselor in, in, in Dwarka, as you know. And it says in Bhagavatam, he says, he's wearing the the, the vestments of Krishna. Krishna's clothes that he's no longer interested in wearing, he gives to Uddhava. Hmm? Here, you take this. I don't, I don't like this anymore. Finish with this. So Uddhava is wearing the, the, the remnants, the prashad of Krishna. Hmm? He says in the Bhagavatam, this is our renunciation. He's speaking about a form of Uttam Bhakti. 
He's Dasya Bhakta mixed with some Sakya in, 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 outside of Braj. But he has some connection with the Braj too. After all, he was sent there. He had, Krishna loved him so much. It's very touching the meeting between Uddhava and Krishna as uh, related in Gopal Champu, the Jiva Goswami and Madhura. He wanted him to have the experience of Braj. Anyway, he did. So he's a special devotee. But he makes this point, right? We Uttam Bhaktas, Uttam Bhakta means to all of you. That means you have Shraddha in Uttam Bhakti, not Mishra Bhakti, not any kind of mixed Bhakti, but Uttam Bhakti. You are Uttam Bhaktas of the Sadaka type. Hmm? Do you understand? Because we are embracing this, this idea of Rupa Goswami, this kind of bhakti, the tone bhakti rasamrita sindhu, arises, as you know, anyabhilashita sunyam yan karma aryanabhita manu kulena krishna nushilam bhakti rupa. Out of this one verse, the whole book is uh, unfolding. The definition of uttam bhakti. It's uh, so. He says, Uddhava says, we Uttam Bhaktas, this is our renunciation. We wear the clothes of Krishna and they're fancy. We wore the, the princely royal vestments of Krishna. This is our renunciation <laughs> to the jnanis who are walking naked, wearing only ashes. Hmm? Scary people. Hmm? You seen them? from the Himalayas with the tridents and so forth. It's scary. Walking only with ashes and and um, long hair and so forth, very unkempt and, and, and Uddhava is it's our renunciation. We dress like this. Hmm? That means it, it makes renunciation charming because it makes it a byproduct of loving Krishna. If you love Krishna, if you love someone, then the things that are not favorable to loving him or her, you won't like those things. You will give those things up. The things that he likes or she likes, they will become your likes. Love means you give me your heart, I'll give you my heart. We exchange hearts. So you work only from, from, from fulfilling my desires, I work only through yours. Heard out what, what does Krishna say? Sadhu, Hridayam, Mayam. Sadhu, sadhus are my heart, and I am their heart. Who would have been saying, We only, this, this is our renunciation. We wear your, your, your hand me downs. Hmm? But it's a very, full face of, our, of renunciation, full face of renunciation. Because it's one thing to give up taking. Don't take. If you get caught stealing, don't take. So if you stop taking, you may be like, why are you hit me? You're taking, all right. Then I won't take anything. I was standing in the corner like a child in school. You stand in the corner with your face to the wall. Mm. All right, I won't do anything wrong. Mm. So this is not, not taking is not the full face of loving. Mm. It's part of it, <laughs> but it's not the full face of loving. He has to turn around, right, eventually. He has to enter into the society again. The Gyanis, they want to leave the society. It's a society of thieves. No doubt, we should want to leave that. Mm -hmm. But where do we go? To nowhere. Mm -hmm. To an indeterminate, ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. But there's no taking, but there's no giving either. There's no giving, then there's no loving. Mm -hmm. 
for love there needs to be movement. Brahman is indeterminate. There are no qualities there. There's no movement there. Brahman is everywhere, so omnipresent and omniscient. So if you're everywhere, you cannot move. There's nowhere to go. <laughs> if you are omniscient, there's, there's nothing left to know. If there's nothing left to know, there's nothing to do. Right? So it's somewhat boring. In comparison to Parabrahman. That Brahman who is everywhere is moving. Really, and, and constantly moving. In the form of Krishna. The Braj Leela is, 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 is fully animated. The more you move on a scale of spirituality from indeterminate Brahman to Paramatman to Narayan, so many avatars of Narayan, to Ayodhya, Ram Leela, special place, to Dwaraka, Krishna Leela, Mathura, you come to Vrindavan. The more you move on the scale, the more the, there will be movement and transcendence. Mahavishnu, oh, he's spending at least half his time sleeping. At least half his time he's sleeping. You make the world, better go to sleep. Oh, didn't turn out quite the way you want. Mostly sleeping, <laughs> waking, sleeping. When you go from Mahavishnu all the way to, to Braj, Krishna is never sleeping. As soon as he goes to sleep, his friends are waking him up. Right? Practically no sleep. He may sleep, fall asleep for a little bit. In the forest with Radha, but not deep sleep. Hmm? Because the sleep is in the context of some anxiety, right? You might get caught. Hmm? Coward friends of Krishna, they sleep. What about that? Hmm? Nanda, Yashoda, and Vatsalya Bhakti, they're sleeping. Hmm? Not really. They sleep, but not deep sleep. If you sleep, but you're just dreaming, 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 you can't get full rest, right? What do they call that sleep? That R-E-M? Right. Mm -hmm. That's when you don't dream, right? Mm -hmm. The mind is also turned off. So their minds are never turned off. Coward boys are only dreaming about Krishna, playing with Krishna, meeting with Krishna. Mm -hmm. But Sally about the they're not getting a, nobody getting a good night's rest there. Only any any only appearance of sleep. Mm -hmm. And Krishna practically no sleep. It means that Bhagwan is fully anim animated there. Mm -hmm. And the animating force is Bhakti. Mm -hmm. Bhakti. Mm -hmm. I think what does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be human? Now the dominant <coughs> Ideas, we need our machines, we're going to make machines that are better than humans. Of course, if you make a machine, a robot, that's perfectly human, then it will start questioning whether it's a machine or not, if it's perfectly human. You will start to think, maybe there's God, maybe there's not. That's what it means to be human. But it means to be human is to ask why, why. Human life is a big question mark. Why? Purpose, meaning, value. Why am I? Why? What is that? This is this is a qualitative question. This question does not arise in animal life and plant life. Hmm? The how question arises there. And nature answers the how question, how to eat, how to sleep. Nature answers this very readily. But the why question, nature cannot answer that. Physical forces have no purpose. You understand? The why question, this is a question of consciousness. 
That 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 nature will push us in another direction to get an answer for that question. For that question, you have to go inside, not outside. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in scientific community, they say there is no why questions. There are no why questions. And we would have to say, why do we have to hear that kind of <laughs> nonsense? <laughs> Only how questions will answer them all. There have been advances in artificial intelligence, that's true. But it's been compared to someone who wants to touch the moon when, stand, when standing on the ground and they climbed up on a tree. They're closer now. <laughs> to achieving what artificial intelligence is is is, is thought to is, is pursuing. Mm -hmm. This is a foolish idea. Mm -hmm. This is a foolish idea. What does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. This human life is in the stage where Krishna can pursue his love life more fully. It is a, is, it is, that is called, it is not a lila, not his deva lila. Deva lila means in Golok. There is some Aishvarya there. Here, this is as if, sometimes they say when they make a movie and they film it on location, that's a special extra feature. They don't make fake mountains in the background. It's a, they actually filmed it in Prague itself, right on the bridge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever. So this is the, the gnarly love Krishna. It's very much facilitated. Love is what makes the human. This is Mahaprabhu's teaching. It's often thought that humans are differentiated from animals and plants because they have intelligence. Mahaprabhu's idea is no, because they can love. Mm -hmm. Because they can love, they can do something voluntarily. Mm -hmm. They can make a sacrifice. Love is born from the womb of sacrifice. And suffering is born from the womb of attachment. And everybody accepts that. Renunciation principle, whether they understand it or not. Mm -hmm. We are just, these are just common sense things we're playing out for. Mm -hmm. Follow me? Hmm? It's good to think a little bit like this. And there's so many winds of thought in the world today that you're contemporary people and, and there are new arguments and thoughts about what the world is, what life is, what it means to be human and so forth. Hmm? If we want to be players in that world and have something to say, we have to be a little acquainted with what they're saying. You can't simply take arguments from 500 years ago, what the world's like, and think we solved all the, answered all the questions and wonder why people don't listen to us. <laughs> they don't listen sometimes because they think we don't know what we're talking about in terms of how people think today and why they think the way they do. Hmm? Our Goswamis, the founding Acharyas, they were fully acquainted with the, the trends of thought uh, during their time. Because they were acquainted with Sankhya, Yoga, Mimamsa, uh, Nyaya, and so forth. These were the prominent uh, philosophies of the time. Does that mean that's all we need to know? be contemporary and speak about Gaudiya Vaishnavism mm -hmm. and, to, and to pursue Gaudiya Vaishnavism ourselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to deal with the currents of thought whether we realize it or not. They're influencing us in our lives. Mm -hmm. How are they making us think? And how does that relate to the, the ground, the philosophical ground of, of, of the Gaudiya Vaishnavism? Does it, does it have any currency in the world today? So it's good to think a little bit along the, 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 these lines. Hmm? Hmm? What does it mean to be human? And Chaitanya Charitamrita really, of course, really uh, uh, seeks to, to answer this um, this question by 
presenting as it does Goswami's view of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. They wanted, as I said, the Goswamis to locate his ecstasy on the sacred uh, map, which is the sacred texts of the time, the, the, the standard of knowledge of the time. They wanted to, to locate him there. Because they felt that if he's not on the map, then we don't need the map. I mean, his spirituality was so obvious that he is, in, in, his, in religious history of the world, there is no person that more embodies ecstatic love of God than Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And that's just an objective statement. I mean, you can't. Uh, too many people witnessed, wrote about, and of course from their own vision and so forth, but consistently you get a picture of a person absorbed in extraordinary um, uh, ecstasy. Uh, Rupa Goswami has written in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, you know, it's a book about ecstasy, a very popular subject. Years ago, many, many years ago, about 40 years ago, 34 years ago, we, we published a magazine we called it Clarion Call. It was, uh, in the, I guess it was in, in the early, mid-80s, so, uh, 30 years ago. And it was circulated in America and stores and so forth. And uh, we had thematic issues. It came out every quarter. Each, each issue was about, had a theme. So one of the themes was ecstasy. I didn't know it was a popular drug at the time, but uh, it was the most popular issue that we had. The idea right, of ecstasy. Happiness, the ecstasy, the joy, the ananda, the bhakti ananda of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Rupa Goswami is writing in Bhagavad Sindhu about ecstasy, about bhava, about sattvika bhavas, for example. He says, I'm only mentioning those that are prominent, which you very seldom see, but anyway, there's eight or nine of them, hmm? nine in Vatsali Ras and eight otherwise. He said, but there are others also, but they're too rare to write about. And those appeared also in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, like, like, like blood, perspiring blood from the pores of his body. Very shocking, the, uh, the figure of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his private life. Hmm? Chaitanya Charitamrita, as I'm saying, you call me, hmm? was commissioned by the Vrindavan Goswamis. Krishna was commissioned to write about the middle pastimes of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the later pastimes. The book is centered on the Madhya Leela, the teaching Leela of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as a sannyasi. What is he teaching? How to go to Navadvip. That's why he defers to Vrindavan Das, O oh, Vrindavan Das, he's, he's the real author, O oh, Vrindavan Das, you know. Because his book specializes in talking about Chaitanya, you might find it in Navadvip. And this is the goal of Gaudiya and Vaishnavism. And during the Kirtan, that courtyard of Shiva Stakur in Navadvip, to know Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sanyasi, and you might find it. Go to Kirtan with him, worship Krishna with him. This Navadvip, that is a Hmm? Right? Don't think that Gaur Leela is different from Krishna Leela. Gaur Leela, Krishna Leela is, there is, without Gaur Leela, Krishna Leela is not complete. Hmm? Krishna Leela is a failure, actually, without Gaur Leela. Hmm? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, I'm saying, the point is, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was Krishna. There can be no doubt about this. You don't have to find a verse here or a verse there. Although the Goswamis did that academically for the sake of those who needed a verse, who afterwards said, oh, anyway, maybe you could translate it like that, but I don't agree necessarily, and so forth. There are other interpretations. Who are you Gaudiya people? Saying this Bengali is Krishna. Hmm? 
<laughs> but <clears throat> that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna, this is really understood. The real evidence is this. It derives from understanding the, the psychology of Krishna. Mm -hmm. This is what the Gaudis have shown, that they understand the psychology of Krishna. If you plumb the depths of Krishna's psychology, then you see there has to be Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Because in Ras Lila, this is the apex, the zenith, the climax of Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. Krishna defers, right, to the Gopika's love for him. He says, I disappeared to increase your love. And seeing your love, I cannot reciprocate in kind. Therefore, your saintliness, your sadhuness, I'm indebted to. And he says to them there, so what I, all I can do to try to repay you, who have shown sadhu-like love, sadhu-like love, love like a sadhu. Maybe three different kinds of lovers. Which one are you? He replied, I'm not this one, this one, this one. Here's a couple more. And this is the kind I am. And this is why I disappeared. I disappeared to see your love grow. And seeing it, I feel indebted to it. And by that he meant, I also feel in doubt about my own position as Rasa Raj, because I see that you taste Rasa more than me. This is an existential crisis for Krishna. Mm -hmm. I thought I was God. All the yogis say that. <laughs> but they don't, they don't know. They don't know that, that I have some doubts. <laughs> this is our theology. People have doubt whether it's God or not. Our God is doubting whether he's God or not. <laughs> These are the kind of theological questions we find in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Most of you find theological questions about the nature of God. Does God exist? In Chaitanya Charitamrita, Krishna is asking, Am I God? <laughs> I see that everyone says I'm God, but secretly I find myself attracted to her. I find her to be worshipable by me. Is she God? She will never accept that. Hmm? Think very deeply. Hmm? And of course, he's good at that. So he's, he, he, he realizes there is something in me that makes her the way she is. And she experiences that from her vantage point. And I cannot experience that. She knows me better than I know myself. We have some experience like that. Your wife may know you better than you. She says, you think you're like that. They say you're like that. I know who you are. Sit down. Eat something. <laughs> Go get the dog. Whatever. So he realizes, it, it's I am God. But there's something in me that, I, that she can access and see. It makes her the way she is, which makes her attractive to me. Hmm? I, so, being if you understand who Krishna is, you understand he 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 has to taste that. Hmm? Yes, this is a psychology. If there's some if there's something to be tasted, some joy to be tasted, Krishna's he has to be tasting it. Otherwise, he's not Krishna. He's not Rasaraj. Hmm? So, if we call him Rasaraj, there must be Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Do you understand? Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the is the is the is the, is the workaround, so to speak. <laughs> how he how he figures it out. This is the genesis of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He tells the gopis, "I will repay you as best I can. Your love is like that of a sadhu. It's saintly love." Hmm? He's also saying there, if you want to be a gopi, you have to be a sadhu. I knew a fellow god brother of mine, and uh, he was found in Vrindavan by another friend of mine, and he was observing the behavior of a young, maybe eight, twelve-year-old girl, 
So my friend said, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to understand Manjari Bhav. I said, better you look at his guru. <laughs> then you better understand what is Manjari Bhav. How is guru is acting? How to become a sadhu? Hmm? We want to sit a day, but we don't care how to use the, to use properly the sadhaka day that our guru has given us. You understand? Rupa Goswami mandates for Raghunuga Bhakti, you have to do seva in a siddha rupa and a sadhaka rupa. Both. We get a sadhaka rupa, sadhaka rupa, sadhaka deha, sadhaka practitioner's body from our guru. Hmm? Right? But then we just want, we want to get a siddha rupa. You think, what, you didn't like what I gave you? Sadaka, you don't understand. From a sadaka deha comes a siddha deha. Hmm? A sadaka deha is a, is a work in progress. The body is made of senses, mind. When the senses are in touch with sense objects, for the pleasure of the senses, this creates a material identity. Our attachments, our sense of my, determines our sense of I. You understand? Out of my comes the material I. Uh, so, when we take the same senses, and we use sense objects for the pleasure of Krishna, another identity is created, another I comes. Hmm? This is the Siddhadeya. Hmm? Arising within such action performed by the Sadhakadeya. Hmm? So by fully engaging the sadhaka deha, the Mahabhu's method, of course, that is Nam Kirtan. This Siddhadeya will come up with Siddha and Chaitanya Charjan. Krishnadas is writing about the middle pastimes. The public life of Chaitanya Mahabhu, primarily. He says it in his book. The main part of this book is the Madhya Leela. And it's much longer than the Adi Leela. Much longer than the Anti Leela. In that section, he's teaching Rupa Goswami. He's teaching Sanatana Goswami. He's converting Venkata Bhatta in South India. He's converting Pravoda, uh, Prakasananda Saraswati in Banaras. Hmm? Teaching Vedanta. He's converting the uh, Sarvabhom Bhattacharya in Jagannath Puri. Hmm? So much Shiksha, so much Tattva. Hmm? This is the ground. He's doing Harinam and understanding philosophy. Hmm? Nam Tattva. He's understanding the, the Sambandha Gyan, the con proper conceptual orientation out of which Nam Shrestham will arise, the highest idea of the name, the mantra, Krishna Nam. Hmm? And as a result of this, what happens? His public life turns, drifts to private life. He's, he's drawn, he's forced into private life and retirement. It, it means his sadhaka, this is, this is Krishna in his Acharya Leela, right? He's playing the role of an Acharya, Krishna. Of course, in the context of that, he's, he's Krishna seeking to experience what he could not experience in Krishna Leela. That's why I say, Gaur is Krishna. No other avatar is interested in Radha's love. Braha is not interested in Radha's love. Nishringadev is not interested in the nature of Radha's, Radha's love. They've got their Lakshmi, that's, you know, that's enough right there. No other avatar has, has Lila Madhurya. No other, or Prema Madhurya. There are qualities of Krishna, Prima Madhurya, Lila Madhurya, Rupa Madhurya, Venu Madhurya. They don't have these qualities. Not even Narayan, right? You know, and none of his avatars, by, by extension. Radha's Prima Madhurya, the full sense. 
return, right? Full face of love, sweet love. So only, only Krishna would be interested in this. Only Krishna would be connected with this. This is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is all about. You wonder if Krishna exists historically as a real, as a real person. Hmm? As if history was the final word on what was real. <laughs> and what was not real. Hmm? <laughs> Who says? There are different ways of knowing, obviously. Hmm? Right? Hmm? How, how real is Krishna? We have to look, look only to the ecstasy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Hmm? How real it is. Our preoccupation with Krishna Leela, which is the preoccupation of Shaitanya Mahaprabhu, what it did to him. Of course, it made him bleed, perspire blood. Do you want that? Hmm? Krishna His brain is difficult to understand. Outside, it looks undesirable. But inside, it is Ananda Moai. It's, it's, it's full of Ananda. And material life looks good on the outside at first, but inside, it's an empty package. It's an empty package. The eye that you have from your sense of what is mine is no more true than the idea that anything belongs to you. If you can't keep it, then it, it, it doesn't, it's not yours. Hmm? Everyone, everyone will accept you can't keep everything. I mean, these are just common sense things that have been said for centuries. Every human comes up with this. You can't keep everything. You can't keep anything. Hmm? Right? Wanting to suffer. As much as you want, you may not. Krishna tells Arjuna and Gita, Dukalaya Mashashpatam. He says the material life is summed up in two words. Dukalaya Mashashpatam. Dukalaya Dukha means it's a place of suffering. And then he says it's a place of suffering, and Arjuna thinks, yeah, but I like it sometimes. And Krishna says, Ashashpatam. Well, you can't keep it. So if you like it, and you can't keep it. Now it's becoming even worse. Because when you like it, and it's going to be taken away from you. So there's a again, people. Everyone understands this. This is very common, common sense idea. Of course, if I tell you just to give up everything, if I tell you love is false in this world, and I offer you instead, stop taking and live in some nebulous, indeterminate. Mukti, <laughs> that you can't say anything about, you can't think about, you can't you can't hear about it, you can't smell it. It's indeterminate. It it's just the end of the suffering. Hmm? You have a valid argument if you want to say, well, I would just rather you try to love anyway, <laughs> even if I can't keep it. You have a fairly valid argument against the pursuit of mukti unto itself. Hmm? Of course, we, some, we have presenting of course, Udav's idea, a very charming idea, right? hmm? giving up in a, something in the context of, of embracing something better. His renunciation is wearing the clothes of Krishna. Hmm? You think, what kind of renunciation is that? Oh, it's very complete. Because not only is he giving up taking, but now he's fully serving. If you want to stop taking, that's one thing. But if you have to serve somebody, you love somebody when you serve them, then you're not going to take, but you have to, you have to do something. You understand? It's the full. If you, if you want to get rid of your karma, you want to big, dig a big hole and put it all in there and cover it over. That's one thing, but it might come up again, right? It might sprout, but if you build a temple on top of it, and do kirtan, it's never going to come up again. Mm -hmm. So this bhakti is the full face. It says that, that what you want 
in human life. It exists. Love exists. The world comes out of love. Vishnu's love. It's Leela. Leela means what, what drives Leela. Love drives Leela. This is the Shristi Leela of Ma Vishnu. So, you know, it's on a lower level than, than, the, than, than, the, than, than the, the Braja Leela. But this is what he does, Vishnu. He becomes many. Hmm? One becomes many. Not for any reason, not for any lacking, but out of fullness. The one becomes many, expands himself. This is us. Hmm? In, in this sense, the world is born out of love, the world of our present experience. Hmm? And granted, it becomes problematic, but this makes a solution of the problem also. Bhakti is always present in the world. Sadhus, avatar, the Veda comes with the world. The problem, of course, it's a play, because the problems don't really exist, they're only in the mind. Suffering only is only exists in the mind, right? You think so? No. <laughs> <laughs> it, it only exists in the mind. Well, only in the mind is there experience. The mind experiences the body if it pays attention to the body. Otherwise, the body doesn't experience itself. It's just gross matter. Only in the subtle matter, in mind, which is quasi-conscious-like, because it has the power to reflect pure consciousness. Chitta does. And so there's a, there's a quasi-subjective realm within matter, and that's the experiential realm. Otherwise, gross matter is, is, is not the realm of experience. That's why yogis focus on mind solve all the problems. Hmm? Materialism wants to make the mind the brain. That sounds terrible. Hmm? That means you really have to suffer. <laughs> that means you really do suffer. <laughs> the brain, it means the brain suffers. It means the physical... There's, of course, it doesn't make any sense that there will be suffering or experience in something that's non-experiential. Hmm? This is what they're trying to say. Hmm? So, so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, hmm? embodiment of happiness, of Ananda. Yes, it looks a little bit on the outside, like, I don't know if I want to cry all the time, hmm? weep, faint, pass out, and so forth. But the Goswami understood it was not epilepsy. Like the Orientalists, you know, the first yeah, yeah, yeah. British missionaries wanted to say it was epilepsy. Of course, we know that epilepsy is not contagious. So. <laughs> it could not be epilepsy. They understood what is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's ecstasy, and they saw it located on the map of the scriptures. Hmm? Okay. And demonstrated to the people who accepted the Shastra at the time, as a standard of knowledge, that uh, the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu must be Krishna in a very special extension of his own Leela to fill in for, make up for what the Leela unto itself uh, in the ways, it, which it, 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 ways in which it falls short. Hmm? So, so Krishna Das is, is, is writing about the Madhya Leela. And in the context of the Madhya what we find is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu drifts naturally through his preoccupation with Nam Kirtan and understanding Tattva uh, and living the life of the Sadaka you know, and really fully um, taking advantage of the gift of Sri Guru in the form of a, of a Sadaka Day, a practitioner's body. It's a work in progress, so our senses sometimes become distracted, sense objects, in relation to who we think we are. And it, that, they seem to reinforce that by that perspective. We, materially speaking, we, 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 we look at the world 
And the way we look at it, the way we uh, hear it, hear it, the way we smell it, the way we taste, taste it, it, as I said earlier, it, it causes an identity to form within us. And it's an, it's an identity that's arising out of, of, a, of exploitation, taking, hmm? controlling. Um, so it's, it's not very pretty. And uh, so we want to convert that. We want to be lovers. So uh, we have to stop taking and we have to uh, start to give. We have to find the center we can take to give to. This is the idea of Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam, the supreme taker, enjoyer. This is sadhana bhakti. So it's a work uh, in progress. We are, we are trying to find happiness in dead matter. Hmm? And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was offering us Goloka. What is Goloka? As I said, love has the power to turn faults into ornaments. So resolve all contradictions. So what? Everything we hear, we hear in Vrindavan, and everything is alive. The trees are moving, right? The rivers are standing still. And Krishna blows his food. The rocks are melting like rivers. Hmm. Everything's animate. The clouds don't rain. They cry hmm. in the ecstasy. Every, if you study Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, you understand every movement in Vrindavan is Anubhav, Satvikubhav, relative to the Rasa, different types of movements that constitute different Anubhavs, Satvikubhavs and internal sanchali bhavs, daiva, and so forth. There's a whole world of ecstasy. Yeah. Mahaprabhu said, Shrotam api Upanishadam dure harikatamrita. The sounds of the Upanishads, ham brahmasmi, neti neti, don't take, don't take, not this, not that. Hmm? All these sounds, dure harikatamrita, kampashu purakara. They're very far from where you can go through Hare Krishna, through Hare Krishna Mahamantra, Kampashu Purakadaya. He's saying, there you enter into a world of ecstasy. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was embodying that. How it would play out in the Sadaka day? Hmm? Shocking. But as it starts to play out in the Sadaka day, as it takes over the Sadaka day, Inner life of Mahaprabhu, you know, any sadhaka arises. This is Vrindavan, then. The whole world becomes animated. What makes a thing dead is that we, we, we look at it through, the, through a dead thing, through the mind only. When we want to take a, th a thing and, and of the world, for the I that's been created by attachment to it, we don't see it for its own purpose. So it's limited. That's why humility, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Chakra, how do you describe it? Absence of the enjoying spirit. When we want to exploit a thing for the sense of I that is false and arises out of our attachment, then we, we don't we don't see the thing for what it is, what its potential is. This is, this is a certain angle of vision that causes us to see a static, so to speak, in a dead world. It's a different angle of vision. Therefore, where did Chaitanya Mahaprabhu experience Vrindavan? Where every river was the Jumas. Every mountain was the Govardhan. Hmm? Right? Mormon Vrindavan. His mind was Vrindavan. Hmm? So it's not about going somewhere, it's about being here. Human life, so much facilitates this. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is, 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 is the best example. And from his public life, he can do his private life. But the power of what he was doing in his public life, living like a sadhu. If we can't live like a sadhu, then 
become attached to a sadhu. That's what we have to do. Mm-hmm. Hear from a sadhu. The sadhu will be very generous with us and help us relative to our adhikar, our eligibility. Mm-hmm. Kapil Dev taught his mother, good boy, that the same attachment to material things as the cause of bondage when transferred to a sadhu is the cause of liberation. So, first thing is to become attached to a sadhu. Then you become a sadhu in your course. You want that somebody of spiritual consequence knows about you, thinks about you, cares about you. And you wish that the things that you would do would, would attract his attention her attention. Mm-hmm. But we're not perfect, so <laughs> it takes some time. But this is how we advance in bhakti. In jnana you will advance by bhairagya. In bhakti you will get bhairagya by sangha. Two kinds of bhairagya. You will get detachment, that kind of bhairagya, by sangha, by attachment. You understand? To a sadhu. And then you get bhairagya. It means now by a special kind of rag. Rag bhakti. Attachment for Krishna. In bhakti we advance by sangha. By ragya, detachment is not an anga of bhakti, but it comes as a result of bhakti. It's not the way, it's a byproduct. And it's accomplished. In an easy way, you can wear Krishna's vestments, as I said. You don't have to go naked. Wear only, only ashes. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we see in Chaitanya Charitamrita, the main focus of the book is the Madhya Leela. The Anti Leela is there also. But what can you say in Anti Leela? This is Mahaprabhu's private life. There he's, his the method to his madness has, has been perfected and he's mad. Hmm? How do you teach Baba? If your daughter says, Mom, what is love? Yeah, my brother said he fell in love. What, what does that mean? What are you, what are you going to tell her? Hmm? Right? How will you possibly... Explain that. You, they're just speaking materially. You know, there's no explanation. As soon as she gets a crush on someone, yeah, she understands what love and she can't talk about it either. She can't explain it either. Uh, no reason though, to it. No reason to it. This is, of course, a material example, but it, it helps us to understand the point. Obviously, we teach something about Bhava, but, but what was the inner life? You have to get an outer life that will correspond with the inner life. One time I was speaking about Kirtan, who was in the United States, and afterwards was in the audience, and he said to me, Swamiji, very nice, but um, my thinking is that the spiritual life, that should be a private thing. That's something we take in the public. So he was objecting to the idea of non kirtan, which is, which is can be public. I said, actually, to, I replied, actually, spiritual life is when your private life and your public life are no different. <laughs> that is spiritual life. Mm-hmm. When we actually live as a sadhaka, mm-hmm. then you come and worship Radha Gopinath here, mm-hmm. then you go home. Mm-hmm. Maybe you, you, you dress a certain way when you come to the temple, maybe not. That's okay. Mm-hmm. But you act a certain way when you come here. Mm-hmm. Then you go home, as soon as you get on the tram or something. Then turn on the, what's on the Facebook, what's happening, what, whatever you listen to, who knows. We have our distractions. Right? That means by our sadhana we have not universalized, understood the universality of our deity. The, tip, the reason we come to the temple is because we can't find God everywhere, even though He is everywhere. 
So we build a temple, say he's over here. So come here. And then we act a certain way in front of God. Mm -hmm. But the, the fruit of that is that you turn around someday and you see him everywhere. Mm -hmm. If you've actually done archan, mm -hmm. Seva Puja. If you've actually done a kirtan, mm -hmm. not from, 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 from music, for the ears, but from the heart. Mm -hmm. When Bhakti Siddham Sarasthitaka was leaving the world, he asked that, the, that his disciples would sing Sri Rupa Manjarit Pada, Mantam Thakur Sama. Kunja Baba asked Pramod Puri Goswami Maharaj to sing. He was, he was a famous kirtanir. He had a beautiful voice. But Sarasthitaka stopped him and said, I don't want to hear a sweet voice. I want to hear a voice with more realization. And he asked, Sri Dharma is the child. He didn't have like a sweet singing voice. Of course, I've heard it. It seemed pretty sweet to me, but, but comparatively, musically speaking. And of course, the greatness of Puri Maharaj, Puri Goswami Maharaj, was that from that day, he accepted Sri Dharma as his Sikh Guru. You see how qualified he was. He didn't say. No envy, no jealousy. Mm -hmm. You understand? Guru Maharaj said, he has more realization than I worship him. Then we say, we worship you. Puri Goswami Maharaj, such example. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. That is very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Anyway, point is, he wanted to hear the song sung from the heart that had some realization. This is a hard exercise, this, this kirtan. Mm -hmm. So in due course, then, the universality of our deity. We had the good fortune today to go to the baby Jesus here in Prague. You know the baby Jesus deity? Yeah. I've got this picture, it's in, it's in the car. Baby Jesus, very nice. You know, a little deity of Jesus. And, you know, children, they know no boundaries. They can go anywhere, right? Naked, like the Kumaras. They can go anywhere. If a five-year-old boy walks in the room naked, you know, oh, no problem. So baby Jesus, he, he knows no, there are no boundaries. For him. He, speak, he spoke to me today about there are no boundaries. Hmm? No, no pejorative sense of sectarianism that has to be overcome. Mm -hmm. Love your brother, your sister, your neighbor, like yourself, he said. That requires some Vedanta to know what is the self and to be able to love. He said, love your neighbor like yourself. How can you do that? Unless you understand what is the self. You can try if you think the neighbor is who he thinks he is. Mm -hmm. And you think, I'm this body, mind complex. You can try, but it, it's difficult. And your neighbors are also the animals. How do you do that? You understand? I mean, giving a basic teaching is a very, very good teaching. Love your neighbor like yourself. And your God with all your heart and soul. When you love God with your heart and soul, then you love you can love your neighbor like yourself because you begin to see everyone as part and parcel of the same God. Yeah? When you understand uh, what is Atma and what is its potential for Bhakti, Bhakti Ananda. Atma, what is that Bhakti Ananda? What is Atma Ananda? Then you can love your neighbor like yourself. That's what the Gita says, right? You all know the Gita in the sixth chapter, Krishna says what? The perfect yogi is one who loves his neighbor like himself. That's what he says. Who identifies with the sufferings of others as if they are his own. He said, This is the highest yogi. I was listening to a class, it was a little entertaining on the way here, 
Somebody in ISKCON was on the tape, so we thought we'd listen to it. <laughs> and um, it wasn't a good class, I, I'll tell you that. Was, but, but I was trying to get a point, you know, uh, from it. And, it. and at some point, he said, he said, and so if one devotee is chanting, and another devotee is chanting, and you don't, and that devotee is pleasing Krishna, and you're pleasing Krishna by the chanting, then you should like one another, right? So how can you not like another devotee who's chanting, he's pleasing Krishna, and you're chanting, you're pleasing Krishna? There was some, there appeared to be there was some discord in the temple. And he was addressing it, you know, kind of like that. <laughs> what I got from the, from the class, but I thought, yeah, that's a good one. I have to tell him about that. You know, <laughs> I wonder if he extend that beyond the borders of the corporate um, group. There, we're chanting, right? <laughs> He's chanting. Krishna likes our chanting. Krishna likes his chanting. He should like us. We like him. Mm -hmm. So it's a good lesson for all of us. Um, so I, I talked to the Jesus about that today. I, I thought this is a teaching. Yes, so the, kind of, the kind of response I got. You should love your neighbor. What is the implications of this? So when anyway, I'm, I've got a little distracted from what I was going to say to you tonight, but I, I'm back to the start. In Antilila, this is where we find the Shikshastakam. Mm -hmm. At the end of the Anti Lila. And Anti Lila Mahaprabhu is 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 surrounded by Rup, Asrup and and, and Rai Ramana. Krishna Das has, has compared them in his book to Lalita Saki and Subal Saka, respectively. Mm -hmm. Catering to Krishna in his ecstasy at Krishna Lila, wondering about Radha and require that Subal chant her name in his ear and getting the blessing of Lalita to approach and so forth. It's just very esoteric, obviously. Now. Some of you are not really familiar with, with uh, the Auntie Lee. But this is his private life. And at the very end, Krishnadas depicts him in Puri, speaking these verses of Shikshastakam one after another hmm? to Ramananda and Sarup, um, remember by Sarup Dhamra. And if you study them, you see what they are is a, in eight verses, they are a in an, the whole teaching of Chaitanya Charitamrita that has gone before that is encapsulated in the eight verses of Shikshastakam. So he's reiterating the whole teaching of Chaitanya Charitamrita through the eight verses in his very brief but substantial commentary on them. So it's an important uh, group of verses, and as a group, as I say, coherently or, or um, consecutive verses, uh, that has first been shown in Chaitanya Charitamrita. And I wanted to speak about the third verse, which everyone likes the most, <laughs> where you're told, Jainada pi suni jaina, turora pi se ishtunam, amani namona dena, kirtaniya sadhari. So I won't have time to go into it, because of my prep, my introduction to it was rather extended, but I will remind you all of this. That this verse is a very simple verse, but very hard to put into practice. <laughs> and, and, and practice is what we need, because practice makes perfect. Only practice makes perfect. You have to use your head to soften your heart. Using your head to study philosophy is only as good as you apply that to make a change, internal change. Mm -hmm. now, this instruction is very, very simple. Mm -hmm. It came from Mahaprabhu. Krishna says, at another time also in the Leela. Now it's coming out at the end, right? As I said. 
But it came at another time also, Mahaprabhu spoke this verse. When? The Guru of Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami is who? Raghuna Das Goswami. At the end of Chaitanya Charitamrita, he, he, he pays his respects to so many Goswamis and, and my Guru, Raghuna Das. At the end of Mukta Charit, Raghuna Das, one of his Lila Grantas, famous one, the pearls, the pearl story, Mukta Charit. He says, and I wrote this book, Ravana Das Kusama, I wrote this book for the pleasure of Krishna Das Kaviraj, my disciple, he means. This is what it means to have a guru and a disciple. I wrote this book inspired by my disciple, Krishna Das. He, he, he brought this out of me. We want to be that kind of disciple. Guru Devaya Vidme Krishna Nandaya Dhimai Tanma Guru Patrodaya Patrodaya To be inspired and to inspire them. To be inspired by the Guru in such a way that the Guru will be inspired. This is Bodayantas Parasparam to Shanti Charam There's a relationship that one fosters the other. You can't have a guru without a student, you can't have a student without a guru. They, they're one and different. Hmm? Right. So, Raghunath Das Goswami, he's the guru of Krishna Das Goswami, and who else is he? In our Sampradaya, he's thought to be the Prayojan Tattva, Acharya. So, we have Sanatana Goswami, he wrote. Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, the seminal commentary on Bhagavatam, Vaishnav Toshani, Hari Bhakti Vilas. So his emphasis there is on Sambandha Gyan. Rupa Goswami, his main contribution, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. This is Abhideya Tattva, the way. Sambandha Gyan is a conceptual orientation. And according to your conceptual orientation, uh, that orientation will foster certain activity. So there's a conceptual orientation that fosters the action of bhakti, which in turn fosters the emotions of bhakti. And when the actions of bhakti foster the emotions of bhakti, then from Abhideya we come to Prayojan, the fruit. Emotional life in transcendence. And Das Goswami, <clears throat> at, at the behest of, 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 of Sanatan Goswami, he says, Sanatan Goswami made me do this. He writes. Yeah. Very beautifully. Poetically, he has written about the prayojan, the highest ideal of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. So this Raghunath Das Goswami, how he got to there, first of all, he got the blessing of Nityanandabhu, the Navadweep. You maybe noticed his story. As a result of the blessing of Nityananda Prabhu, he could escape from home hmm, and join Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Puri. And there Chaitanya Mahaprabhu put him under the care of Swarup Damodar. And there he was serving, he was very young, under the care of Swarup Damodar. And he asked Swarup Damodar, Mahaprabhu's secretary, can you ask Mahaprabhu that I would like to get some personal instruction from him? So Swarup Damodar asked Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu said, He's listening to you. What, what does he need to, You know more than me. Srup Dhamara, we see in Aunt Tavita, he's a teacher of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. How to step into the... He's teaching Krishna how to step into the Bhava of Radha. Hmm? Lalita Saki, she knows what is the Bhava of Radha. Subal knows also. Hmm? Or if you want to look at Amananda Roy's Vishaka, she certainly knows. She's born on the same day. 
So same temperament in many respects. So they are teaching Krishna how to enter into the to assisting into the Bhava of Radha, which is what Gorli is about. The last verse of Shikshastakam, Krishna says, and Radharani spoke this verse, it means it's done. He did it. Haribo. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Krishna has become stepped into the shoes of Radha. It's done. This is the end of the book, you understand? It's done. And Radha spoke this verse. Asli Shiva Padaruttam Panastumam Adarjanam. You know this verse. So this is spoken by Radha. It means Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission is complete. Krishna's mission is complete now. Mm -hmm. So he did he, he was tutored in this. Gadadhar Pandit is Radha. He gets out of the way in Bhuri that Mahabhu can step into that power. Mm -hmm. And in the company of Ramananda Roy and Sarup Damdar, he's coached and he becomes successful. Mm -hmm. So who is Sarup Damdar? Mahabhu says, he wants to hear from me, but I put him under you. You know more than me. I'm learning from you. So, he did not entertain the idea of who's to have done that. And he asked again. Could you ask Mahaprabhu again? I'd like to get some instruction from him personally. So finally Mahaprabhu said, okay, bring him. I'll tell him something. You know what he told him? He said, don't read Facebook. <laughs> don't get involved in Prajalpo. Hmm? He said, don't do that. He's te you think, what will he tell him? Right? He's the Prayojan Tattvacharya. He wants a special instruction from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Hmm? What, what high thing will he tell him? Hmm? So we pay close attention. Mahaprabhu now going to speak to Raghunatha Goswami. And he says, Don't get involved in gossip. Hmm? And Prajalpa, you know, Prajalpa. Hmm? He says, and he said, dress simply. Don't be concerned about what the latest fashion is. Don't, don't be a, eat simply. That's what he told him. Hmm? This is coming from the mouth of Mahaprabhu into the ear of Sarup Dhamana. He said, then there may be some other things, and you can learn that from Sarup Dhamana. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know what he said? Krishna says, he said this Trina rapi suni chena, Taro rapi seishtana, Amanina manadena kirtaniya sada. This is the other time it appears. In Chaitanya Charitamrita. Mm -hmm. Mahaprabhu was speaking to Raghunath Das Goswami. Mm -hmm. If that instruction is good enough for Raghunath Das Goswami, it should be good for us. Mahaprabhu says, by chanting in this way, then very quickly praying will come. Mm -hmm. But coming to Nishta, it means, that's a whole other explanation of the verse, but to come into Nishta, then, then praying will come. In Nishta, one's faith becomes very firm, one becomes very sure. And with that confidence, he or she becomes very flexible. You know, you see people, they're very confident, but they're not very flexible. And that's not Nishta. They're very fixed, they channel their rounds, they get up very early, they shave their head regularly, whatever. And they tell, they spit out so much dogma. Do it like this, should be like this, should be like this. They say the same class every time and tell you, you should be happy. <laughs> you should be in ecstasy. Be happy. <laughs> You're chanting. Chanting should make you chant. Prabhupada said, chant and be happy. You should be happy. <laughs> I heard this class today. I, I that was part of the class. You should be happy. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> So, so, no, mm. not like that. Mm. No. <laughs> yeah. no. I got a little distracted.
This verse, Raghunath Das Goswami, this is good enough for him, should be good enough for us. Mahaprabhu said, when you chant like this, this is the decorum of a devotee. These are the regulative principles of a devotee, to be humble like a blade of grass, to be tolerant like a tree, to expect no honor for yourself, give honor to others. This is, this, 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 uh, this are, this is, this is, uh, like a state of mind. Mm -hmm. When chanting in this state of mind, then, then very quickly praying will come, he says. <laughs> this means one becomes very confident, but very flexible at the same time. Because one has real experience of the self in Nishtha. And one has consistent experience of the spiritual reality. Because he or she is not distracted when chanting, practicing, and very acquainted with, with the teaching, taught that underlies the Nam, Kirtan, and so forth, Bhakti, Bhakti Tattva. And there's a lot to learn there, so it's meant to consume your mind. Because he or she is a sadhaka, you know, you study the angas of Bhakti and Bhakti Rasamita Sindhu, they're angas for the voice, angas for the eyes. Angus to engage the ears, engage the mind, and so forth. It's a whole thing, right? It's a whole lifestyle. Bhakti is a lifestyle, right? It's not something you just do in the morning and then change your dress. It's a lifestyle. So, one becomes sure by way of fully engaging the intellect and if the senses, mind, and intellect are engaged, then there will be consistent experience. We sit down and chant to go somewhere. Hmm? What will I find out today about that place? Hmm? Where Krishna Nam is the wealth. Kolokel Premotan, Purinam Sanjit. It is the Prem, Premotan, the wealth of Kolok. It has been exported here by engaging in that. What, what will I experience today? Every day new. Every day new. Every, seeing Krishna every time new. I've never seen him before. I can't take my eyes off him. It's, it's just consistent experience. So one is sure, but one is very flexible also. One is very sure that they're getting very close there's something that's very big. And they're sure that I'm, I'm sure that I'm very small. I'm very sure that I'm very small. And I'm very sure that I'm in touch with the kind of knowledge that I cannot take and put on my agenda, but a kind of knowledge that has me on its agenda. We're accustomed to taking knowledge and putting it on our agenda and pulling it out to show how smart we are, mm -hmm. to get a job here, to make our way, hmm, to get false prestige or whatever it may be. Hmm. This knowledge won't work like that, only counterfeit form of it. Hmm. So what is the surety in Nishta? Confidence. Hmm. We're confident. As you come close to the infinite, you know what it means to be finite. And that the infinite would come so close, make you weep. I'm so insignificant, but he's treating me like this, like I'm his friend. What kind of infinite, infinite in love he is. You wanted, you wanted, to, you wanted to taste love, and he's like, you were thirsty, and he threw you in the ocean. You want water? Anandam buddhi vardhanam. Anandam buddhi vardhanam. I wanted to be happy, <laughs> but now, now I'm bathing in happiness. Hmm? And the happiness is making me weep. And my hairs are standing on end. Some abhas only in this. Some shadow 
what, what, what to come. So one feels very confident, confident that he's very small, that Krishna is very, very kind, very merciful, so certainly I'll be successful. Not because I'm great, because I'm such a good chanter. And I wish you were. Why not you? Why aren't you, why aren't you fasting on a cross? Like me? Like that. Mm -hmm. I know I'll be successful because mm -hmm. I know how kind he is, how merciful he is. Mm -hmm. There's no one more merciful who would have said it himself. Mm -hmm. What did he say? Oh, Bakiyam Stanaka Kutam. He gave, he gave Prem to, but to Putin, certainly he gave to me. Who in their right mind would say we take shelter of anybody else? What kind of idea of God you have? This, this God sees nothing. You look like a devotee? Oh, looks like a devotee. Let me go there. Hmm? And give myself to him. So Nishta, this, this verse, a third verse of Shikshasana, is about this stage. Hmm? In this stage, the road ahead is no longer winding. It's straight. Mm -hmm. But it's not narrow. And now it's very wide. And rules and regulations become realizations. And verses have many meanings. Mm -hmm. And there are many gurus. Mm -hmm. And everybody's a guru. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning from everything, everywhere. Mm -hmm. This is the be really beginning of real experiential spiritual life. And mm -hmm. Mahaprabhu has given us this uh, fourfold kind of decorum, as they say, or behavior, uh, disposition to cultivate along with his method. Chanting Harinam. So we want this is an interim goal. We want to become gopis and gopis. That's all a very good idea. We should know about that for sure. But we should know if you go to the mall, you know, and you want to go to room 108, there'll be a map. And the map will say 108 is like way up here. And what else will it say? And you are here. You have to know both things. Where to go, where I am, and what is the next step. Focus on the next step. And each step that you focus on, which is the next step in front of you, you're thinking about that place hmm? while focusing on the step ahead. You don't differentiate the step ahead from the goal. Hmm? Some people differentiate the step from the goal. I want the goal, but I don't want to make the step. I can't understand that the step is is the goal in the seed form. Hmm? If you come to me and you say, Swami, do you have any mangoes? And I say, yes, I have mango. I'll give you a mango. And you say, I heard they're very sweet. Yes, they are. i give you one. Here, there's a little seed. And that's a little bit. Seed, mango seed. And you say, he would say, say, Swami, it's very dry and very hard. I wanted a mango. I said, no, that is a mango. What do you mean? And I said, oh, well, do you take it and put it in the ground, make a hole, and bury it? He said, Swami, mangoes are up above the ground. They're not in the ground. Mangoes are up on the top of the trees. I said, no, no, you, just, you put it in the ground, and bury it. Hmm? Now put water on it, sun on it. Come back in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then you will see one little mango. Don't eat that one. Mm -hmm. Don't eat that one. Don't take that air and say, I got a mango, sure, but I got a mango. Mm -hmm. Because if you get a little bhava, then you want to show everybody, it will just dry up. You open it up, oh. There's no juice in there. <clears throat> you have to come back next year. Mm -hmm. Gradually, you have to understand the point. So. Mm -hmm. 
So we should know the goal. Don't be ignorant about that. Know the ideal. Know how it comes. What will be your bhav? What will be your rati? What will be your association? These two. One will determine the other. The seed of rati is sarasanga. If you associate with Ram Bhaktas, you will do Ram Bhakti. And from Ram Bhakti, you will get Ram Prem. What kind, of, what, what kind of love you will have for Krishna that will be determined by your sangha. Right. So, Gaudiya Sampradaya, there are two opportunities for us. A particular kind of Madhurya Bhav, Madhurya Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's dispensation. And no one is giving that out more or assisting the world in, in acquiring that or tasting that than the Dhananda Prabhu, who happens to be in Sakribhav. So invariably, inevitably, some people will be affected by that influence. That is the beginning influence of Gaudiya Sampadaya. Hmm. Another thing, I'm writing a book about that, but we won't go into it. So these opportunities are there for us. Sakyabha and a particular kind of Madhuri Rasa. Hmm. And by association, Bhakti Samskar for that will come. You won't see it. You learn through your chitta, and influence. And then, as you chant and hear, and heart becomes cleansed, and you become fixed, and so forth, then you have a desire. It seems like your own desire, it is. But it's coming from influence, other, other influence. Hmm? Desire to taste this kind of bhakti. And then, as your desire becomes, is expressed in the environment of the sarup shakti, which is serving only to please Krishna, then the details of that will be filled in by your sankalpa, by your will, in connection with the sarup shakti. You understand? Every gopi, every gopa is different. Some like bananas, some like mangoes. There are desires there, all of them pleasing to Krishna. What are the details? This is will we call sadhana in relation to the mercy, the grace, and the impressions that come from sadhasanga. These combined, that will give you a place in the world. Shivandam Dam Ki Jai. Mahaprabhu Ki Jai. Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Ki Jai. Premanandi. Thank you all very much. What's the time? Okay, so, any question? Yes, sir. There's a mention of the different steps to the goal. And we actually have uh, discussions about things uh, like uh, what we feel when we do genuine uh, spiritual advance. I, I can I understand it can be individual, but are there some general rules? What should be happening to us if we do spiritual advancement? Because, like Christians say, we follow the rules, and then we, when you die, it will be decided how and how. Right? Now, follow the rules, change 60 rounds, and when you die, you go go out, you go there. <laughs> That's the idea. But our idea is that we should feel during the process something happening. Uh -huh. So it should be like the guideline, I'm doing it right, I'm not doing it right. Is there some general rule that we can uh -huh. hold on to? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To do it right, then you have to do it sincerely. That is the main rule. If you want to love, you have to love. You understand? So, the main rule is that you, you actually exercise your heart. Just like you want to chant and you want to pay attention, right? But the mind follows the heart. So, we don't find some other way to control the mind. But we give our heart to Krishna, and the mind will go there. So, if you chant, for example, like prayerfully, hmm? you cry because you cannot cry while chanting. You understand? And you, you, you want to be sincere, and, and, and you, you, so you give your heart, 
then your mind will pay attention. If you're not giving your heart, then your mind will listen to itself. There's no better way to control the mind. But it's hard to exercise the heart. <laughs> it's hard to exercise the heart. The other things in the heart are getting in the way. But that we have to try. So, you, so uh, point being that you're asking for some like, what are the rules, the guidelines, and so forth. So, the center of all this, Krishna tells Arjuna, Arjuna says, how am I going to do this? Yoga is very difficult. What you, what you laid out here, it's very difficult. How can I be successful? Maybe I won't be successful. And Krishna says, no, I told you in the beginning. Be, I'm, now we're in the sixth chapter. I'm giving the end here of the teaching on yoga, and it corresponds with the beginning of my teaching about yoga. Remember when I told you at the beginning, in verse 39, I said, Obviously, I was talking about bhakti yoga, because bhakti yoga has fruits that are eternal. Gyan yoga, that's come from sattva guna. Karma yoga comes from raja guna, so they cannot give permanent results. So I was talking to you about bhakti yoga, and I said, this kind of yoga, a little bit of practice, and there will be never any loss. It's, it, 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 the gain will be eternal. Now we're at the end of my teaching about yoga. And I'm talking about bhakti also. In fact, I'm just about to tell you, what is the last verse of the sixth chapter? Yoginam apisaravesham madhutene antaratmanam shadavan bhajate sami yoginam Do bhakti. Having said that, he enters into the middle chapters. And it looks like in the middle chapters, suddenly, while in the first six, six chapters, Krishna was talking about you. You are amazing, he said. You cannot be burned. You cannot be drowned. You cannot be hurt by any weapon. When he goes through all this at the end, he says, all I can say is, you're amazing. To think about you is amazing. To experience you is amazing. To talk about you is amazing. You're feeling pretty good. After the first six chapters, you're pretty cool, according to the Gita. But now in the seventh chapter to the twelfth chapter, Krishna appears to start talking about himself. And you might think, the guy's kind of, you know, full of himself. He says, Om Saras But Krishna's not really talking about himself in the middle chapters. He's talking about bhakti. But he can't talk about bhakti without talking about himself. He has to talk about himself. So it's a secondary. But anyway, mm -hmm. Krishna is asking, Arjuna is asking, mm -hmm. questioning whether I'd be successful. And Arjuna says, you don't think like that. In bhakti yoga, there's never any, you can't be unsuccessful. Unless you go against bhakti, of course, then that, that's a problem. If you go against bhakti, even in bhava, you can lose your bhava. That's possible. But obviously, you, that's not something to do. So we don't want to make any offense, right? To nam, no seva puja, offense, uh, and so forth. Those are there. We know them. We learned them. Hmm? We avoid offenses. He says, He goes right to the core. The way I'm answering you, he says, Arjun, sincerity, that is invincible. So if you ask, how do I know that I'm sincere, Maharaj? That means you're sincere. <laughs> that you ask such a question. That means you're sincere. So don't overthink. That's one thing. Don't overthink it. You try to give your heart sincerely. And you're the own, your own judge for that. You can know if today I gave my heart to it entirely. Or to what extent. You can have sadhasanga. You can come here, how many days a week can we come here? Once a month? Once a week. Mm -hmm. Once a week. Anyway, you <laughs> find some friends, Sangha, you get together. Every night, you get together and you sit in a circle, and then everyone talks, and everyone says, how I got distracted today. You do that every night, and you'll stop getting distracted because you won't want to have to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> this is Sadhisanga, you see. Satam. This is another name for devotees. Honest, truthful. Hmm? 
It's a very bold, radical idea like this. So you find some, some devotees like this, you get together, and you talk about it in, 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 in confessional, go to confession every night. Hmm? You don't need the priest there, just make the confession and you'll get purified. <laughs> so the point is that you can judge your own temperature in this regard. Now, in the context of being sincere, you might make some mistakes, but they'll be compensated for by your sincerity. And when you understand you made a mistake, of course, you'll want to do it right because you're sincere. That's one thing. But I think maybe you're also asking for signs. How do I know I'm making advancement or something like that, progress and so on. And, and really, in one sense, if you have to wonder whether you're making progress, then you're probably not making progress, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lady, a girl, who was pregnant, and the doctor said you could come into labor at any time. But she had never had a child, so she told her mother that, Mom, I'm going to take a nap, sleep, so if I go into labor, wake me up. You understand? Mother said, you're going to labor. <laughs> Nobody's going to have to wake you up and tell you that you're in labor. <laughs> okay. You understand? So how do I know if I'm making advancement? But if you're making advancement, you will know it. And you should make advancement every day. In fact, we're not. It's, we have some, some work to do, something like that. That said, also, you're also making advancement by the way in which the philosophy is causing us to change our life. Hmm? So it is causing us to look at life differently and to act differently and so forth, and, and that's, that's a change. Spiritual life is about change. It's not about staying the way you are. Hmm? It's about changing, because you're not happy the way you are. So um, there's some kind of groundwork, you know. Uh, there's, you know, the analogy is there. Rupa is given of the person who has jaundice, and they take the sugar cane because the cane will cure the jaundice, but when you have jaundice, sugar cane tastes bitter. So there may, you know, you have to get to the point where the medicine of Nam becomes food. In Ruchi. But how you'll get there, you need some philosophy you know, to ground you. You need to, your intelligence has to be applied. Keep good association, otherwise, when you advance, you'll see, oh, that's what the book is talking about. I remember many years ago, I was with Prabhupada for three months. Three months? I think it was three months. First time I was able to spend time in Los Angeles. He, I was initiated before that, but he came for three months. I think it was like 19, the winter of 1972. And every day, I would go to class, and I would, we would go out the door to go on the walk, I would be there, and come out of the car, I would be there, and so forth. So I was very attached to being, to probably being there. And, and then, then one day, one of the devotees told me that Prabhupada was going to be leaving in three days. And suddenly I became overwhelmed with this feelings of separation, although he wasn't gone yet. And, and it was... And, and I was weeping, and I was uh, ecstatic. And so I could understand, oh, this is what they're talking about, the book talking about this. It's happening to me in relation to, to my guru. Mm -hmm. So the book is there, it tells you these things, and, the, and your experience will correspond with that. And yes, you're right. We, have, we're, we experience now, it's not that you chant and then die and go to heaven or something like that. Right? You have to go now, go there now, so to speak. So, um, but, uh, you know, we all come from different backgrounds, so we have different lifetimes of experience and so forth, so some hit the ground running and all the flowers don't blossom at the same time. We shouldn't be discouraged by, by being a late bloomer. <laughs> we encourage that we're in, a, we're in the garden at all. That's what matters. And that someone else is blooming around me is not any cause for envy. That's a cause for joy. It's working. <laughs> and I'm doing the same thing. It will happen to me too. Something like that. So, you know, you have to understand what it means to be a sadhaka and think, and it's very beautiful. My guru has given me a sadhaka deha, the body of a sadhaka. Let me work on that. Make it perfected. It's a work in progress. 
Um, but the, but again, the map is there on the scripture. But first, perhaps before consistent taste will come, some taste will come, when you come to a very powerful situation of sangha and a festival and kirtan, maybe you get some you know, experience from, from, from that, or, or uh, it's, it, you know, it takes time for different persons. But um, other than that, other than the, the experience, a little experience of the mind stopping, oh my god, that's so nice. The mind stopped, and I was, I was left. In other words, the body stopped because I was fully using it only for Krishna, so it's not moving for its own purpose. And now the mind is stopped, so what's left is me. And it's not only me, the Atma. Atmananda, it's me coming out of mind and senses under the influence of bhakti, so the same bhakti ananda. And so, first it will come a little bit here and there, maybe for an hour or two or three or four, then for days, then sometimes for a month, and then it will your gone. It's not yet fully terminated, so it will return. So it takes a little time, but. But besides the experience, higher experience, that's so confirming, besides all the philosophy, right? Little experience, it's just you can have a thousand classes in one moment of ecstasy, so I'm convinced. Right? Besides that, then there's the other things going away. But if other interests start to wane, mm-hmm. then that's a sign that you're making progress, right? Because Janayati Ashu Vairakim It said that by bhakti, very quickly, detachment comes down to it. So, these are the signs. So, 